Hello, everybody. There are probably as many definitions of marketing as there are people in the room. So I wonder how you'd define it. I had a pretty defining marketing moment about 11 years ago. So picture the scene. I'm studying marketing and advertising at a college in Cape Town called Red and Yellow. And the MD of an advertising agency called Saatchi and Saatchi comes to speak to us about branding. He introduces the concept of love marks. Love marks, he explained, were brands and products that people came to have an extraordinary loyalty towards. They had this emotional connection towards them. And he explained to us that when companies with strong brands were evaluated, this brand equity actually surmounted to kind of a financial asset. So I was fascinated by this concept of love marks, and I decided I wanted to learn more about them. So at the time, we had to choose a love mark of our own and tell a story about them. So I chose Apple. Who remembers when kind of Apple was breaking out and you'd see people with the white headphones, and if you didn't own an Apple device, your heart would kind of race and you'd become rapidly envious. So that was me. Um, I had black headphones, I kind of despised these things, and I wanted to be part of the Apple magic. So Apple was a love mark of mine. I finished my studies, I worked in advertising for a year, I went on to work um, at an NGO, and then I joined Yappy Chef, as Carol mentioned. So Yappy Chef was a, a small e-commerce startup. I joined as the sixth hire. By the time I left four years later, we'd grown to 100. And my years at Yappy Chef were particularly formative because we succeeded in turning Yappy Chef into one of these love marks. And I'm, I'm not just saying that. There was some kind of third-party verification of this. So um, VentureBurn wrote an article about Yappy Chef and described our following, our sort of brand following, as cult-like, which is a little bit creepy, but it was also quite a compliment. So how did this happen? At Yuppie Chef, we really cared. We cared about the products we sold. We cared about our customers deeply. We cared about one another, the staff. There was an incredible rapport between everyone who worked for Yuppie Chef. And this somehow translated us into us creating this world that people felt this strong emotional connection towards. So I'd worked there for four years, and I was ready for a fresh challenge. I moved to London, and I joined a company called Woo Themes. And about a, a week into working for WooThemes as a marketer, it sort of slowly dawned on me that I, I joined quite a different world to what I was used to. So I don't know if any marketers in the room have kind of would relate to having this experience. But the world of WordPress was very technical. The products were digital, so very different to what I'd been used to selling. Um, people loved data. And the people who coded seemed to be the kings and queens, and the people who were very lauded. Um, so I found myself in this strange world and felt like a bit of an alien, and I wondered what marketing was going to look like in this world, and I was about to find out. So I joined the Woo team. That's us in Berlin last year. There's a bit of a strange slash through the middle. I'm not quite sure what that is. But um, yeah, the Woo team scaled quite a lot, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to be sharing about. This is our roadmap. And before we dive into that, just by show of hands, who's familiar with WooCommerce, apart from all the branding that you've seen here? Yay, that's very encouraging. So my job is done. No, it's not done. Um, so WooCommerce is a plugin for WordPress. The way I describe it to my family um, is that you just add it to WordPress, and it sort of creates a shop for you. So into the first learning, learning to embrace change. I don't know how you all feel about change. By nature, I don't particularly like it. In fact, I'd probably describe myself as change resistant as a person. But um, it's something that I've had to learn to embrace working at Woo, and even more so joining Automatic. So if you've been a part of a team that scaled rapidly, you'll understand this. So when I joined Woo, we were three. I was doing a typical mixed bag of marketing, writing blog posts, doing tweeting, um, sending out some emails. And that was great. I was a generalist. I was doing all sorts of bits and pieces. And then we started growing. So Nicole joined our team. She was great with content. She was a great editor. Aviva joined our team. She was a data nerd. She started asking difficult questions about ROI and why I did things certain ways. Kevin joined our team. He was a performance marketer. He was great with SEM. So you'd think that this would be delightful, but actually, I was horrified. Um, I liked being a generalist. I liked controlling things. I liked our team being little. And what was happening was I was being forced to embrace change. So at the time, I read an article which was really helpful which described this process as having to give away your Legos. So if you've seen children playing, or if you remember being a child playing with Lego and someone tried to take it away from you, you didn't want to give it. And that's slightly how I felt at the time. 
but this, this article was really helpful. It said there's a unique feeling of ambiguity, chaos, and stress that comes with doubling or tripling your team every six months. If you don't manage scaling proactively, you can end up in trouble. Who's been part of a business that has scaled quite rapidly? Again, show of hands. Yeah, can be a little bit uncomfortable. So fortunately for us, it was very well managed, and huge kudos to Warren, who was my manager at the time, who kind of steered us through this change very ably. So yeah, I was forced to kind of have a bit more of change experience when Wu was acquired. So Wu was acquired by Automatic in 2015. Fortunately, we were more like cousins than strangers, in the sense that Wu was already remote, Automatic was also remote. There were a lot of similarities, and it was a great fit. But it did require this flexibility and adapting. So with change, we have choices. We can dig our heels in. We can not give away our Legos. We can make it difficult for people who are coming in. We can believe that the best days are behind us, and we can hark back to the golden days. Or we can be willing to embrace change and see it as a bit of an adventure. So that was one of the first lessons I learned. John Mader, who's sitting in the front row right over here, says that it's important to find the right balance of hope and realism, not becoming too gloomy about the future or unrealistically optimistic about our current state. I love this idea of balancing hope and realism when it comes to thinking about our products and what we're doing, and even ourselves. So here's a story about when I, I became a little bit too gloomy. So the e-commerce landscape is quite competitive. There are a lot of interesting players doing a lot of interesting things. We're one of them, which is fun. So WooCommerce comes with some challenges as a result of being open source, which this crowd will be familiar with. Things like people adding strange extensions to their sites, updating, and their sites breaking, or small business owners feeling terrified of touching code and having to learn this thing of WordPress. So it comes with some challenges, but Open source is also WooCommerce's greatest strength. Our market positioning is that we're customizable. But in being very focused on everything else that was going on around us, it, at one stage, I, I began to see Woo's openness as a weakness. Now, at this point, I feel like maybe the, the stage is going to open, and I'm going to be swallowed into a pit for even saying that. But, but it's the truth. I began to feel Woo's openness was a bit of a weakness of ours. Um, but yeah, this obviously was faulty thinking, because it's actually the very thing that sets us apart. The thing that people love about WooCommerce is that it's customizable. You can hook things into it. It's what makes it really cool. So now we're choosing to kind of lean into that. I've reframed it in my head. And the theme for our WooCommerce Developers Conference is open e-commerce. So it just took a bit of reframing. So in this thing of balancing hope and, hope and realism, I wonder where you're at with your product or whatever it is that you're working on. No doubt it's a mixed bag. There are some parts that probably make you roll your eyes. There are some parts you're really proud of. But if you've got a bit of a competitive personality or you're keeping an eye on what others are doing, just be sure to kind of remember your strengths and be balancing hope and realism. So this is where this talk takes a turn for the personal. Um, but I believe that there's power in vulnerability. So here we go. Who recognizes this little character? Yeah, this is Hero. He was designed by John Hicks, who also designed the Mozilla Firefox logo. When I joined Woo in 2014 as part of my hiring trial, I was asked to write a brand document, kind of a brand guide, and I wrote a story about Hero. It was a backstory. It was intended to be sort of a personification of our brand. So I wrote this little story from my understanding of Japanese culture, and it was submitted as part of my application, it was appreciated, and it was actually added to our brand guide. Flash forward two years, I come back from a very relaxing holiday in Rome with my best friend to something of a storm erupting eternally. Now, mind you, all of this was internal. So to cut a long story short, a long story short, 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 short someone had, had flagged this story as um, cultural appropriation and it's being non-inclusive. So considering this, the spirit in which it was written, this was absolutely shocking to me. I think I experienced about 100 emotions in a split second seeing the comments that were going on. And yeah, I was, I was absolutely horrified. And I put my hand up, I took ownership of it, and so began a process supported by incredible colleagues 
and people who were willing to be honest with me to help me understand this thing of unconscious bias, which I hadn't really encountered before. So with the best will in the world, um, yeah, I'd written this story, and it, it wasn't inclusive. That was the bottom line. The brain uses social stereotypes in order to simplify the massive amounts of information that it receives from the world. And heightening the effect is the human preference for people who are similar to us. The vast majority of these processes are invisible to the, to the conscious mind. So whoever you are sitting in this room, I challenge you to think about this. No one likes to think that they carry unconscious bias. It's not a pleasant idea. And yet, it's, it's almost, well, I'd argue that it is unavoidable if you're just one person. So what does this boil down to in terms of marketing? For me, it, it's one of what I consider to be one of the most valuable lessons I've learned as an adult. Uh, and in terms of translating this lesson into marketing and into WooCommerce, we've tried to start just being really intentional and mindful about this. So here's an example. When we launched our collaborator accounts, um, Gareth and I, Gareth's the designer on our marketing, marketing team, we spent quite a while discussing whether or not this image was inclusive. Now, I don't know if you think it's inclusive or not, and I don't think we ended up, we didn't end up doing anything groundbreaking at all. But it was the fact that we had this conversation that I think was such a healthy sign. We were thinking about it. We were thinking about whether this was inclusive or not. Another example, um, we did a spring promo recently. I hope you all got the coupon, bought some things. Um, but if you look at the sign off line in this mail, half the world doesn't experience spring in April. And I'm actually from that half of the world. So in the sign off line, we included a little acknowledgement of this. We said, three cheers for spring and autumn. Now, it's a tiny thing, but I think it's, as marketers, we need to be thinking about how we can be inclusive. And it's these little steps that we can take. So there's no silver bullet here. John Meta touched on some of these points earlier today. I think one of the keys is hiring for diversity. I think diverse makers, diverse groups of marketers end up producing content that's diverse. If you're a small team or you're just a person on your own, um, you can surround yourself by diverse discourse. You can just be really focused on breaking out of your echo chamber. So that was my story about unconscious bias. Storytelling and connecting to the who. So who has seen an article lately telling them to use storytelling in their content? It's like, yep, everybody's seen it. So I'm about to do the same thing and tell you that it's a great idea. So, but first, some, some other thoughts and a bit of a metaphor about content, because I love metaphors. So this guy looks like he's doing quite well at this party. Um, when you go to a party, you're trying to meet people, you don't really go blazing in, tell everyone about yourself, big yourself up, talk about everything that you've done, and then start demanding things from people, maybe even demanding money before you even have a relationship with them or before you know them. So I think that this is a little snapshot in terms of understanding content, and it's certainly the way that I think about it. I think of content as an in. It's an inroad. It's a way that you can win time, you can win a bit of attention in a very, in a very frenetic world that we live in. As products and brands, content's a way, a way into conversations. I think that's a great way to think about it. Compare this to a Tupperware party, where someone who you think wants to spend time with you invites you over, you arrive, and it turns out that they just want to sell you something and you feel duped. It's similar to clickbait. I, I don't understand the logic behind clickbait. It might get you traffic, but it does nothing for your brand, and it does nothing for your bounce rate either. So we should be aiming to make content in a way that's more similar to a cocktail party that's going really well, and not like a Tupperware party. So this thing of storytelling, a story about story, a storytelling. Um, the WooCommerce Showcase was launched in 2015. We created this as a space where we, we hoped that our merchants would submit their sites and just share about what they'd been building. So people did, it was great. And from the entries that came in, we would spot one every now and again that we felt would make a good story, and we'd tell it on our blog. So here's an example how e-commerce was a game changer for an entrepreneurial Lithuanian mum. And this was quite an inspiring story. It was a very inspiring conversation for me. I loved speaking to Igla, the lady who I spoke to. Did this post make us any money? Who thinks this post made us money? Oh, 
so clever. Yeah, it didn't, didn't make us a lot of money at all. Um, is it worth doing? Yeah, I would argue that it's priceless. And here's why. It gets us what got me talking to our users. So as sellers of digital products, we don't speak to our users very much, do we? Unless you're already absolutely nailing this and doing this all the time. We don't naturally speak to our users. We don't naturally see them. So how do we stay connected to them? For us, including case studies and stories in our marketing mix has been a really kind of consistent way we've made sure that we keep, we keep doing this. But for me, something interesting happened here. So when our team was smaller, I used to write these posts. But then our team grew. So I didn't need to write the case studies anymore. I'd, I wasn't the person handling tweets and replying to our customers anymore. And gradually, I got a little bit, a little bit disconnected from our customers. And the thing, I, I didn't even really realize that it was happening. Until on a, a trip we went a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago to Detroit. So I'm going to share a story from that. We went to Detroit, it was a meetup, and this lady, Kay, shared her story about her business. Now, Kay lives in Detroit. She's got a pottery studio in the outskirts of Detroit, and she shared her story with us. She is hustling. She's hustling to make her business work. She's working hard. She's using WordPress.com, actually, to share her business online and to get traffic and to make sure that she's on the map. And something happened to me listening to Kay sharing her story. My heart completely engaged again, and I had this realization that I'd lost something that had really been pivotal in marketing that I'd done before, which was this deep connect with users and this deep care and concern for users. So it was a wake-up call for me. Ooh. I don't think you can really have a sense of the why of your organization if you aren't deeply connected to the who it is you exist to serve. So just practical tips here. If you're thinking about doing this, is set up user research calls, turn the conversations into stories, include them in your marketing mix, and remember to tell them internally as well. Because you might find that there's someone else in your organization who's become a bit disconnected too, and having a culture of storytelling and celebrating the stories of your customers is just a good thing. There's a postcard from afterwards, which is fun. Social media and return on feels. I'm not sure if, I don't think we coined this return on feels thing. Who's heard that before? Yeah, maybe we did. OK, well, kudos to Kevin and our team if he actually made that up, because that's kind of amazing. So social media has always been a big part of what we do in the world of Wii marketing. We used to use Pinterest as well, but we axed that for focus reasons. So now we use Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So something I think people forget about social media is that they're just channels. They aren't these magical things that are going to suddenly turn you into this overnight success. We probably all know that. The other thing I think people forget about social media is that they behave very differently. So if you create this wonderful piece of content that's going to add value to your users, it's going to be your in at the cocktail party, and then you smash it out across all your social media platforms in exactly the same way, it's not going to perform as well as when you optimize it per channel. So content behaves slightly differently in different channels. So by way of example, here is how we announced Facebook for WooCommerce. Um, I've included a screenshot of the Facebook post, a tweet, and an Instagram post. And just a few little thoughts on each of these. Facebook, unless you're boosting your content, ain't nobody going to see it. So you need to be thinking about that. Um, yeah, Twitter, you can mix things up. So sometimes we'll share things as a link. Sometimes we'll share an image post. We're also starting to experiment with doing more ads and remarketing on Twitter, which is interesting. Twitter using emojis and hashtags. Every time you do that, you just get better engagement per tweet. We probably experienced that just using it personally as well, but it works if you're a brand speaking in that space as well. And Instagram, you have to think that it's at a glance consumption. So people aren't going to click out of Instagram and go and read an article. They want to get value out of it at a glance. So a little practical thing is to include a vanity URL rather than something long. So like with blog posts, we measure our success of social media in terms of traffic and revenue. But if that was all we did, I think it would, be, it would end up being quite dry. So we have this other kind of magical metric um, in our team, which is return on fields. And we, we like to sort of do things every now and again that are just, to, just for fun or just to make people smile. So for example, this is uh, a tweet that Gareth shared. 
so the fourth example there, um, the, the options for bookings were, I can't actually read them without my glasses on, but the fourth one was a little bit of a joke, basically. And the point with this is just sometimes it's okay to do something that's just a bit silly, I think, as brands. I think it communicates this roominess and this healthiness that is, is really positive. Here's another example. I think it's healthy to do this, and I think it's good. MailChimp are very good at return on feels, aren't they? If you've done email marketing, there's that moment where you're about to send a campaign and you're wondering if you've made a typo, and the sweating finger is there, and then you hit send and you get a high five. It's awesome. What they're doing there is showing empathy. That creates return on feels. So there's a little picture of our team laughing. I think laughter and fun does something really healthy for human beings generally, but also specifically for marketing teams. I don't think miserable teams produce content or anything that's very inspiring. So I think, yeah, sort of striving for fun is a good thing. Another thing that's good to strive for is creativity in marketing. I think if we're focused on the bottom line constantly, this can fall by the wayside. So nourishing a team's creativity is really important. And from that article, it says that in a company, creative thinking must occur on a spectrum between art and commerce. I think that really sums it up. When I joined Woo, we were basically just sending transactional mails. Every now and again, we'd blast out a mail to our entire list. The way we've used email has really changed over the last couple of years. So who uses email in their marketing at the moment? It's pretty standard, pretty staple. Yeah, we did. it. So there are various ways you can do this. Um, we use MailChimp integration. So a few thoughts on email. Send a newsletter. So if you've launched a product, or if you're thinking about launching a product, you can start gathering email addresses, and you can send people an email monthly. I'm a big fan of newsletters if they're done right. I think they work best when they include a bit of company culture, a bit of product news, um, and again, have this idea of adding value to your users. It's not all about you and what you as a business want to be achieving. This is a newsletter that a friend and ex-colleague of mine started. Even before Bryce had launched Metric, he was gathering email addresses. Bryce will tell you he's not a marketer, but he understands that it's important. And when he launched Metric, he began sending out this newsletter, and I look forward to these updates a lot. Bryce, if you're listening, I hope you never stop sending them. Something else that, that works consistently well for us in the space of email is doing localized emails and geotargeting. So this seems to be a bit of a theme that's actually been coming through in all of the, in all of the talks, is um, being sensitive to who you're speaking to and being inclusive. And I think doing geotargeted mails and doing localized content is something that fits into that realm. So this is two examples. When we launched Square, we did localized content, even down to if you zoom right in, the currency signs on that spreadsheet were kind of adjusted. We did the same for the UK and for the US. And when we launched Snapscan in South Africa, we did the same thing. So I highly encourage you, if you're not already, to experiment with geotargeting emails. They really convert and perform very well. Something else that performs very well in the space of email is segmenting by subscriber activity. So again, if you aren't doing this yet, I highly recommend you do. MailChimp lets you segment by who's showing interest in your emails. So you can create a list that's dynamic and fill it with people who are all four and five stars, and you can send your four and five stars an extra mail per month, which is what we do. And I can't share figures, obviously, but this mail really does perform very well. So I highly recommend experimenting with that if you haven't yet. Another tip with email is to explore automations. So this includes things like abandoned cart, but you can also set up automations based on um, user activity. So we recently set up a first purchase automation that's also performing extremely well. Basically, whenever someone buys a product or creates an account on WooCommerce.com, they get added to an automation flow that sends them 12 really helpful emails to help them get onboarded into the world of Woo, help them get set up. And again, this is not all about us. It's not all about selling and stuffing it with product links. The goal here is to just help people get onboarded. Um, so yeah, I, I recommend doing that if you're not trying automations too. Automation is a hard word to say. That's the first mail of the automation, just to give you a little look in. The fourth thing about email, who's used ASAP hand wash before? Anybody? Yeah. OK, I absolutely love it. If I go into a hotel or a restaurant that has ASAP, it's like, ding, high quality signal. Um, so I don't know what those things are for you, but I think we all have them. 
And for me, for emails, high quality signals are design and copy. So if you're going to take up some of someone's precious time, life is short. Uh, you may as well make it really great to look at and really nice to read. So really nice to read is probably subjective, but at least you know, making it grammatically correct, um, maybe throwing in some alliteration, doing something interesting with your sign off. Um, so yeah, that's something to think about. Think about high quality signals in your emails. And finally, just remember, um, social media and emails are just these channels and chances to speak to them. Speak to people. It's all about what you put in them. I didn't like maths at school. I was a non-fan. I yawned my way through stats. Not a data person. So I joined the world of Woo, and suddenly people began asking questions about how I'd done things. I really did get by for about five years in my career without really having to worry too much about numbers. I'd just say I was doing things by my gut, and that seemed to be fine. But at Woo, this didn't really fly, and it, it continued to not fly at automatic. So I've had to learn to love data. And I'm pleased to report that I actually really do now. I find it extremely helpful. So for our Woo marketing team, we've put together a report. We've got six metrics that we look at in terms of how our marketing stuff performs, and we, we're guided by this. It's important. Marketing needs to have these objectives. It needs to have this framework. And actually, at the end of the day, as marketers, you want to know that what you're doing is contributing to your business objectives. So it's helpful. It's healthy. But at the same time, I won't abandon my gut and my instincts. So Seth Godin, I'm a big fan of Seth Godin, says, your instincts are better than you think they are. Data is essential. Data lets us incrementally improve just about anything. The keyboard in front of you, the sink in the bathroom down the hall, the supply chain for the food you eat, they were all improved 100,000 times over the years. Data-driven evolution towards efficiency. It's not enough. We also need you to leap, to leap without sufficient data, to go with your humanity and your instincts and your hunches. So I'm a believer in these things, but equally, I'm a believer in being led by data. So starting to wrap things up. Branding today, thinking back to love marks, brand equity, how these things all weave together, and our role as marketers. My colleague Gary shared this article with me. I highly recommend you read it. The title, um, When Everything's the Same, It's the Brand That Makes the Difference. Now, that's arguable, but it resonates with me. And the author of this article was the point he was making that as we produce products as we get better and better at matching what competitors are doing, as the table stakes are just having an excellent product, it, it can be the brand that makes the difference. It can be those emotional connections that I was speaking about. So brands in the past used to be built with big TV adverts, expensive bud budgets, above the line messaging, brands with these kind of faraway things that you couldn't touch and talk to. But these days, things are very different, aren't they? Brands are more like very, very high-res photographs made up of thousands of tiny pixels. Or since we're in Paris, perhaps they're more like pointless paintings with thousands of tiny brush strokes. Everything we do as marketers, every piece of content we put out, every tweet, every email, every sign-off, every tiny part of UI is like one of these pixels or these tiny brush strokes. And my philosophy is that every single brush stroke counts. So a definition of marketing based on what I've shared today. Marketing is about reaching people, fetching, converting, and keeping them. It delivers value above the noise and creates emotional connections. It seeks to serve, not be served. It seeks to include, understand, and delight. It requires empathy, flexibility, and humility of its makers. It thrives when powered by both instinct and data. Marketing is an invitation. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Marina. This was uh, so interesting. A whole new world for me. <laughs> thank you for sharing the knowledge with all of us. Um, I am quite sure there are some questions. And um, we would like you to use the standing microphones, which are two of them here in the front rows and two of them in the upper rows. So if there are any questions, please go to the microphones and don't feel shy about it. You can ask almost everything. Yeah, anything. <laughs>
So please use microphones if you want so. So if there are, yeah, there's a question over there. Thank hey. you. So my name is Claudio from Team Mile. Hi. My question to you is how did you integrate data uh, with your intuition? You are talking about that, and I'm interested to know at what data do you look no, do you look now? Thank you. So what dates are we look at? So sorry. So the, I think if I understood the question is what dates we look at to sort of guide our marketing. To be honest, I had some problems to hear you. So I'm just going to answer that. Okay, I think that's fine. So we um, at Automatic we have an internal tool called Tracks. So we use Tracks, which isn't very helpful to anybody else out here. But we also use Google Analytics. It's very helpful. The six metrics, perhaps that, that's what you were asking about. We look at um, revenue, new revenue, renewal revenue. We look at traffic. We look at WooCommerce services adopters. Again, something specific to our audience. We look at list growth. Um, and we look at one other thing. So I hope that answers your question wherever you were out there. OK. Uh, there's nobody at the microphones. So um, I would like to ask you, um, is there maybe something, or what, what is maybe the biggest mistake that you have made while you have been uh, involved in Tuvu? OK, let me think about that. I've made quite a few. It's a case of choosing <laughs> which one to share about. Um, a mistake that I made, it's actually another kind of inclusion one, so maybe I'll mention this. Um, in South Africa, okay, if I'm doing this, woohoo! <laughs> that's like in South Africa, we call that a Mexican wave, but that's not called a Mexican wave in a lot of other parts of the world. So I, in an email that I sent out, I said something like, we're really excited about it being the holiday season. It's like a Mexican wave ripping through, you know, woo, and we got a, a huge backlash from people pointing out that that was actually kind of quite offensive. So that was a bit of a mistake. That was about a week into joining as well, which wasn't great. So that was a mistake. Thank you so much. We have another question here. Uh, hi, Marina. It's hi. Alec Kinnear from uh, Folio Vision. Uh, I have a question which uh, is about a recent decision uh, we made where you decided you used to have this really cool policy that if I bought an extension, I could renew it for support and updates for 50% off. You've just changed this policy that all renewals uh, for supports and updates are at 100%. And as a marketing person, that's kind of a big blow to the brand and to the marketing. And so I'm really interested in how you're going to handle this difficult marketing challenge. Mm, that's a great question. Thank you. So I think who, who would look forward to doing a pricing strategy change? No one. So it's not an easy thing to do. Um, looking slightly beyond WooCommerce, and this is my answer, so I speak on behalf of myself. Um, I think that it's healthy to renew products at 100%. I think that for the WordPress ecosystem and all of us as business people trying to make businesses, I think renewing products at 100% is um, it's healthy. If you back the support that you're given, if you back the updates that are included, I think that it's an okay ask. And I think perhaps our mistake was not doing that from the beginning. So that would be my answer. The, what I like about the 50% renewal is that it rewards loyal customers. So I, that is something that I... I agree about the rewarding loyal customers. So Can you come closer okay. to the microphone, please? I agree about the rewarding loyal customers. So yeah. when people have bought into your product and your system uh, with this loyalty rewards, even then, it's a big change. And yeah. so whether one agrees or disagrees about the pricing, I'm interested in, as a, a marketing person, how you handle the the reaction from your customers mm -hmm. so that, because it is a challenge, and yeah. what, what, are you, what are you going to do to make it, uh, to help people accept this in, yeah. in, a, in a way that they still love your brand? Yeah. I mean, I, di I disagree with it, but I'm not interested in my disagreement with the, the, the issue. I'm interested in how one deals with a huge challenge like that. Yeah, so it is a challenge. It's a business decision. As marketers, we need to think about how to handle that and pitch it correctly to our customers. So something that we did do is we did it as a test initially. We tested people's reactions. And the response was surprisingly not, not as outrageous as one would think it would be. People were quite accepting. We allocated resources specifically to discuss it with people. So if people wrote in asking about the change, we, uh, I think people even actually hopped on a couple of Skype calls to talk to customers. So it's something that we've taken seriously. Um, 
We have an FAQ page about it where we say, if you'd like to discuss this with us, get in touch, and we're committed to doing that. It's a decision we felt we had, we had to make, so we're sort of handling it together. But I think being caring, hearing people's concerns, and looking at how we can continue to reward customer loyalty, perhaps just not in that way, I think that's the challenge that we face now. It's a great question, though. Thank you for asking it. Thank you, Marina. I think, oh, no, there's another question. Is it, it is the last one. So please, go on. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Wash from Codable. Um, I have a question about tracking different channels. So how do you decide uh, on attribution, which channel is performing and to what degree? Mm. That's a great question as well. <laughs> so with um, social media and the blog, um, a lot of what we look at is contribution to sales. So you wouldn't be able to say conclusively, you know, this blog post, you can look at, so we look at a blog post, how much exactly that blog post brought in, and then we look at also kind of contribution to sales overall, because obviously there is this slight challenge of attribution. So um, we look at individual post performance, and then we look at contribution to sales, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more about it afterwards if you'd like. Yeah, but um, it is very important to think about attribution because a lot of the platforms that we use for measuring things, it actually you end up with inflated figures because everything wants to claim that it's the thing that contributed to the sales, which ends up, you can just do the maths and it doesn't work. So, yeah, you need, it's a great question. Attribution is something to think about. Yes, Marina, thank you so much for this great talk. You, we all appreciate it. A big applause for Marina.